Well, hi, Sax Kwame fans. This is Steve Goodson. I'm speaking to you from the Command and Control Bunker here at Sax Kwame World Headquarters up in the Upper Garden District of Old New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz. And I'd like to welcome you one and all to the fourth in our series of Facebook Live seminars about saxophones. So tonight's topic is, uh, why did my saxophone have these features? Um, and I got to give you a little background about this. It is something I feel quite strongly about. And if you look at Selmer, Yamaha, Yonagasawa, uh, Kyleworth, uh, um, Max Sachs, Marriott, any, any one of the, quote, better brands. And I ask you, show me what's different from one to the other. Now, I, I, I want something I can touch and feel. I don't want to hear, well, it sounds, it sounds. Don't give me that crap. I know better. I've been doing this a long time. I want to see something I can feel. And uh, I don't see a lot of that. Now, all of those are extremely, extremely high-quality instruments. That being said, frankly, they ain't dimes worth of difference in any of them. So, what I'm going to show you tonight is some of the different things that have been done to saxophones over the years. And I even got in our warehouse and dug a couple of horns out from my... Uh, the private collection. Um, but these are all things that I think ought to be included on saxophones. Uh, some we include on some of our horns. Many we don't. Uh, I probably should, you know. That's on me. But I do want to introduce you to a couple of concepts about what is possible. And next time you're in the music store thinking about buying a new saxophone, Ask them why it doesn't have this stuff. Okay, let's start with the neck. Now, we did a seminar on necks recently, and we learned that the neck is where the sound is shaped and where intonation is set. But there are a couple of things that you want to be sure you get on the neck. And one of these is, on the business end of the neck, you want to be sure that you got a nice ring and plenty of mass in there. Oh, uh, here, you can see the ring on this one. Yeah, that's a very manly ring. And that's because the metal here at this point is very thin, and it'll split on you if you don't have a nice ring soldered on there. Now, in this, we've got a neck enhancer um, soldered on there, uh, not soldered on there. It slips on and off. Uh, another thing that's good, and you can do this to your neck, is here on the interior of the tenon, and yeah, now you can see it, get the interior of that tenon threaded, so it creates a boundary layer where the, um, as the, the air goes, okay, I think we're back reconnected now, sorry about that, uh, but anyway, uh, that boundary layer will let the wave go through there a, a little easier. Now, on your necks, you're going to have octave pips, and, and let's talk a little bit about that. That's that's the little thing, that, the little hole. The way that works is that vent uh, allows you to uh, cancel out the fundamental and get the first overtone, which is an, uh, essentially an octave. But the octave pip, because it's a kind of a small little hole, will tend to whistle a little bit. So be sure that you thread it a little bit and get rid of that. Now, let's get down to some serious stuff. Listen, there are 12 semitones in the chromatic scale, right? Right oh. And your saxophone, unless you got one of ours, has got two octave pips. Well, in the perfect world, you'd have 12. Um, and that would enable you to play one octave and somewhat perfectly in tune. But modern saxophone literature has, guess what? All that altissimo stuff. 
And, you know, I don't think there's much excuse for not having an Altissimo octave key. Now, you guys check me out on this. But in 1867, Mr. Adolph Sax was building saxophones with four octave keys. And also, when he was a professor of saxophone at the Paris Conservatory, he taught his students that the saxophone had a four octave range. Now, he used a saxophone that's got an altissimo octave key. You see, you uh, operate that guy back here with this, this little job. Oh, look at that. It's just like the low A key on a Barry, but the octave key itself, the altissimo octave key, is up here on the neck. See that little guy moving? Yeah, that's a great thing. And that is something that will come in very handy with any kind of modern literature, because uh, the altissimo, let's face it, folks, not easy. Uh, now, another thing that some makers do, most don't, is offer you as original equipment multiple necks. Well, why not? Because if you'll build the necks out of different materials, then the, the, the different materials will enable you to have different sounds. And after all, uh, flexibility is quite a thing. Hey, Lance Ellis, how you doing, buddy? I hadn't seen you in a while. Last time I saw you, I was trying to head out the door, take my wife to the emergency room. But anyway, um, multiple necks, great idea, and you ought to ask for it. It's true that a couple of the companies um, do offer some aftermarket neck. I know Yamaha does, and uh, I think Selmer does as well. Now, most of the saxophone pads that come in all the horns I named and 95-plus percent of all the horns that are out there uh, most of those pads are made of, of sheepskin, and sheepskin's okay until you start putting silicone in it, and, and it makes that awful kissing sound because it's sticky, and then the pads stick, and you're unhappy. I'm going to tell you something. Kangaroo leather is the way to go because kangaroo leather is the softest leather on the planet, and in addition to that, it is the strongest leather on the planet, and it does not stick because kangaroos are marsupials. Um, here's uh, one of our uh, pads with kangaroo. We, we do ours in black. I'm going to show you some later in a different color. But, um, you know, we think the black looks sexy. Um, but the kangaroo leather lasts longer than any, any other type of pad. Now, you'll notice that on this pad, this has got one of our experimental resonators and all these uh, wobbly things here. This is to increase the surface area. If it was just plain flat, wouldn't have as much area. But if you increase the surface area, it increases the efficiency of the resonation. Uh, here's some other guys trying to sell me these resonators here. They're pretty, too expensive, but they're pretty. Um, and, and these are, are mildly dome shaped, just barely domed. But the beauty of these, and, and in, on a lot of good, the better resonators, see the back of those? They're set in with screws. That means you got an expensive set of resonators. When you get your pads changed, you can just keep your resonators and not have to buy another set. So, resonators, good thing. Most resonators are put in with a rivet. Um, some of them with a, a little thing you melt, most of them with a rivet. All right, now let's get down to some serious stuff. And just between us saxophone players, if you're sitting there working on the altissimo and practicing uh, that rasher top tones for saxophone book or Ted and I studying high harmonics or Bob Lucky's saxophone altissimo book, let's face it, just between us, high G can be the most difficult of the altissimo notes to get consistently and to get good quality. So here's something I would suggest that you look for, and that's this. Look here on the back of this horn. What's this? That, my friends, is a high G key. Uh, here's a high F sharp over here. I'm looking at it. That's a high F sharp. But that's a high G key. And that's something, um, hmm makes it just like any other note on the saxophone 
just like any other note. So, you know, high key is no big deal. Uh, by the way, uh, anybody that wishes to like this and share it is free to do so. Now, here's another thing that we think is a uh, very good idea. I, re I told you earlier that in the perfect world, your saxophone would have 12 octave vents. But that's a mechanical uh, impossibility. Uh, I once built a saxophone that had six octave vents, and um, it'd stay in adjustment for up to five minutes at a time before I'd have to adjust it again and work on it. But there have been, over the years, a couple of different systems. Let's look at this one, see if we can get a good shot of this. Look, look. one, two on the body, and then one more up here on the neck. Well, that particular horn there was made in the year 2000 uh, by uh, a company in Taiwan called Narita. You may know them better as the uh, maker of the Unison brand and uh, that particular horn. Oh yeah, that's a Steve Goodson model. But in 1938, 1938, the great Sandy Runyon, hey Donna, the great Sandy Runyon built this on one, two, three. This is a Con Model 28 Constellation. This one's an original lacquer too uh, from my personal stash. And believe me, that additional vent on the body does wonders for fixing you up with that uh, fourth line D that's always so troublesome. So. Be sure and always look for horns that have as many octave vents as you think you can reasonably maintain. Here, I gotta put this one back on the stand. I got saxophones scattered all over the place because we're gonna look at a lot of different horns. Now, as we play our saxophones, and anybody who spent any time being honest with a tuner <laughs> that you had on, on your music stand while you're practicing, knows that it's very difficult to get those palm key notes in tune. It really is. They tend to be sharp and thin sounding. So here's a mechanism that we added to altos and tenors a few years back. And when you press the octave key, which of course you're going to anytime you're playing the palm keys, then what happens is, see this guy over here? The octave key moves that, and that in turn closes the, what I'm gonna call the C pad here, right under the front F. See how this guy move? Yeah. It doesn't close it all the way, just closes it part of the way, and it closes it just enough to bring those palm keys into perfect, perfect tune. And while I've got this horn out, I want to show you something else that's just bad, cool, that, uh, you, you know, we ought to be putting on our saxophones today, and so should everybody else. But look here, you, you, you're in there playing along and all that, and suddenly you got to reach for that high F. Wait a minute, I don't have to pick my finger up. Why? Because look here, there's a roller on that front F key. Ooh-wee, is that ever, ever a good idea? Hey, Kathy. Um, but this is something that uh, we're going to bring that back. We, we strictly are, because that's a good idea. Now, yeah, we, I, I can use this same one. This is this is a pretty common feature. I, I know this is seen on some of the Yamaha horns uh, and, and some others. But if you look right in here, you see that these stack keys are all screw adjustable. In other words, you don't have to take your horn to the repair shop every time that cork gets compressed. Uh, you, you can just take a little screwdriver and adjust that, and man, does that ever change your world. Um, because it, it, make, it makes it so easy to maintain the instrument. Uh, and, and that's something, never buy a saxophone without screw adjustable stacks. And, and on many saxophones today, not all, but many of them, uh, the um, uh, screw adjusters are available on both the upper stack and the lower stack as well as uh, some of the other keys. 
right. Now, I want you to do this with your saxophone. I want you to play the middle finger C, and then I want you to play the chromatic C with the B finger and the middle side key, okay? Go back and forth. Go back and forth. They sound different, don't they? Makes me crazy. Also, those palm keys sound a little thin. So here's what we've done, and for years, before we started doing this on our uh, our saxophones, I, I was adding this to people's Selmas and Yamahas. Let me get this where we get a good picture of it. Right here, look here by the B key. You, you see that? You see that extra? What in the world is that? That, my friends, is an upper stack speaker key. And what it does is it gives a little additional venting uh, to, the, to those notes, and that venting is just what is necessary to get a good voice, and there's no difference between the different fingerings for the C. Jesus, how you doing, my friend? Good to see Jesus on, on with us tonight. Uh, so that's something that's uh, a really good thing. Now, I don't know how many repairmen we got in tonight's audience, but something that makes all repairmen crazy is the fact that when you're adjusting the C key over the bis key, you know, you got to file the felt or bend the key or such as that. Unless, here we are, see which one's easiest to see it on. Like this guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look here. Get this guy up here. Just one minute, but right here, right here, look at that. You can, you can just dial that thing right in with a little little screw, and, and it's always going to get out of adjustment over time on every saxophone that's ever been made. So you can you can come in there and uh, adjust that. You won't have to take you on to the shop. Uh now, you know you you're there. You're playing at the Hollywood Bowl. It's your turn for the solo, and here's your moment of glory. And you get up there, and you lay back, and your G-sharp key sticks. Oh, man. What a miserable thing. So, here's what you can do about that. You can get yourself one of these mechanisms here. Look at all this stuff here. And, and, and the way this works is, is simply like this. When this moves up and down here, this portion of it is attached to the G-sharp key itself. It's, it's soldered on there. So when this comes up, the, the, the F-sharp pad contacts this bar and it pulls that up. It can't stick. I mean, I'm telling you, it can't stick. And believe me, this will save you a lot of embarrassment if you get yourself a horn with one of those. Um, now, here's a couple of other things that have been used over uh, over the years that I think are a good idea. And once again, this is something, I don't know, it's a good idea. <laughs> we probably ought to bring it back. Uh, this is a, a 1914 Holton really weed off model. And one of the things we know, if we've got to trill from high C to high D, it's very, very awkward. Unless, of course, you have this dandy little gizmo right here that operates that little gizmo up there, and it's a high C to high D trill key. And man, is that ever slick. Sure it is. Um, another thing that's great and I think we're going to put this on the next series of altos and tenors that we make, is this, which is a G-sharp trill key. And it may be just because I'm getting old and my, my little finger doesn't move as well as I would like for it to. But, uh, you know, that that's something that I think is a very good thing. Now, this horn, like so many other old saxophones, there are a couple of different ways you can do this. But this one has got, see, 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 see this guy back here that's moving on the back of the horn? Most times you'll see that um, wedge shut because some repairman doesn't know how to adjust it. 
uh, don't use that repairman ever again if he doesn't know how to do that. But what that is, is, is instead of having to finger your D to D sharp like that, you, you, you can just trill it like this. And man, you can trill like nobody's business with that. Um, that's a very good way to do that. Now, that's been done. There's another way to do that. And on this particular horn, you can see, see see this little key down here that's right underneath the D key? Well, that does exactly the same thing. See that little guy go? And I really like this a little better. Uh, it's a direct drive system, but the problem with this is, uh, is that where that hole has to be is right at the bell to body, uh, excuse me, the bow to body tube joint. And, uh, eh, if you ever have to work on the horn, you got a tone hole right in the middle of where you need to be doing the work. So, uh, that's not a, that's not a very good thing. Now, it ought to be somewhat comfortable to always, uh, ha have your horn hanging off your, your body in a very comfortable fashion where you get it where you don't have to chase it with your head or pull your head back or down any of that where it's just perfect but we're all built a little bit different so and we sell this part and it's cheap i think it's about 30 bucks but look at this a three ring strap hook so you can hook up at any one of these three positions and and the the geometry kind of compounds you see and when it does that you know you you can you can change the the angle of it uh, significantly and, and you can just dial it in for maximum comfort now something else that we think is a real good idea because it shouldn't hurt to play your saxophone is look at that thumb rest right there that boy there <clears throat> supports the last digit of your thumb. And, ooh, is that ever a good thing because comfort, comfort, comfort is where you want to be uh, on, on this. Now, uh, another thing that's very important to keep in mind is that when you're playing your saxophone and you're playing the lower stack, when you press the F the E or the D key, then what you, what they also do is, is they close the F sharp pad. And when they do that, the F sharp pad, here, here's the F sharp pad, here, here, here's the F, here's the F sharp. But look here, let me get it in here. We've got an extra little bar right here. So should that get a little loose and sloppy, you can dial that puppy in uh, you, you can even fix that while the piano player takes it solo. Um, and it will enable you to make sure that the lower stack is nice and tight and that the, uh, the, the lower notes always speak their best. And by the way, you guys go ahead and feel free to like or share this presentation. Uh, so we talked about the stacking justice. Now here's another great idea. You know, when you were first learning to play, the teacher said, uh, hey, Donna Schwartz, uh, listen, if you want that fourth line D to speak real well, just go ahead and open the low C sharp key while you're playing that fourth line D, six fingers and the octave key, and that'll give it a little extra venting, and you'll get a better voice and all that. Well, back in 1914, they had another idea. They said, why don't you just build another little key right over here. It's right here by the low C sharp key, you see. And it does all that automatically. I have seen some um, Yonaga Sawa made berries that had that uh, as well. And I think that is just a dandy, dandy idea. Now, another thing... Uh, not that I've ever played any of those joints like you saw in the Blues Brothers, Brothers movie with the chicken wire in front of the band stage. I really have played a place that had chicken wire in front of the band stage uh, back in about 1964. But, uh, you know, some of them tougher joints, you need to protect your horn to the extent that it's possible. And for that, don't leave that low C sharp exposed. Get yourself a horn 
with a low C sharp key guard. A key guard for low C sharp. That is something that will really protect you and save you a lot of money when that horn's in the repair shop. Okay, here's another thing that I've been doing. I've been adding these to pe people's existing horns for years, and uh, you know we certainly include them on all our horns, and we're not the only ones that do it now. But you'll notice that here we have two arms on the low B flat, the low B, and also here on the low C. And why would we do that? Well, those cups are awfully, awfully big. And because they're so big, they, they tend to move in a horizontal plane. And because they move in that horizontal plane, leaks will form. But if they're attached at two points, can you move side to side and uh, end the problem. All right, as far as stuff on your horn, there's other one other thing, and this is something else that I promise you uh, we're going we're gonna to do in the future. This is a, um, I don't know, mid-60s, Bourguignade-built uh, LeBlanc system uh, horn. And here's all my palm keys, but look over here. That, my friends, is the highest sharp key touch. So I can play all of those just like that. Oh, we! I can play the front F like that and catch that F sharp. That is genius. It, it's short. It doesn't have any flex to it, um, and it's very comfortable. Something else I like on this particular one also is look how they give you some additional support on the uh, the thumb rest. Uh, I, I I think that's very very comfortable. Um. A couple other things that I have done uh, to some of my horns just to show you that this is possible. And this is not stuff we sell, so you're safe from me. This is an additional weight. This is a five ounce nickel silver weight. Uh, you get these from Meridian Winds. Uh, my good friend Eric Satterley up there, good brother Eric. Um, but th th this thing will change your life because it'll make those low notes pop right out. And it just it just goes right on your bell to body brace. And Eric makes those for most horns on the market today. Uh, another thing that is, uh, I think, really good, if you guys had worked on as many horns as I have over the years, you'd know that a horn come in the shop and the thumb screw is broken off and it makes you crazy because you got to extract it and get it out. Well, here you get one with a nice big head that ain't going to break. And uh, that is a grand thing. Now, some people say that changes the way that the uh, horn plays, and maybe I'm not a sophisticated enough player to recognize that, I don't know. Here's another thing from my buddy over at Reed Geek Morrow. I got these great little weights, also adding mass, adding mass is what we're doing. And this is, is a great little thing and it gives the upper notes a lot more presence. And then, uh, let's see, you may have noticed, those of you that see me play gigs, I've often got one of these on my horn. This is a, a, a reflector. So, so instead of having to blow into the wall or bitch at the sound man about how bad my monitor mix is um that lets me hear myself and uh you know that's important for me to keep up with it so if you have questions comments uh, criticisms suggestions please let me know and uh we thank you very much for watching i hope you'll all remember to practice long tones each and every day and remember Keep your read wet. Goodbye for now.